Hi everyone. I hope you're having a great time at Privacy Supreme. My name is Anushka Jain and I work as the Transparency and Right Information Fellow at IFF. Today we will be talking to Mithali Nakonde, who is the working who is the founding CEO of AI for the People, a non-profit communication firm that seeks to change tech neutrality narratives. Mr. Konde currently works uh sorry currently holds fellowships at the digital civil society lab at stanford university and at the U institute of advanced study at notre dame she is a member of tiktok us content moderation advisory council and is also an affiliate at the berkman klein center of internet and society at harvard university prior to this she worked in ai governance during that time she was part of the team that introduced the 2019 algorithmic and defects algorithm acts as well as the no biometric barriers to housing act in the us house of representatives ms nakonde started her career as a broadcast journalist and produced documentaries for bbc cnn and abc she now also writes widely on race and technology and we are extremely happy to have her with us today hi mithali i'm so excited that you are here with us today Anushka, I am so honored and I'm so looking forward to this conversation. Great. So let's get right into it. Uh, your work in US focuses on biometric surveillance and how it affects certain communities disproportionately. So could you help us understand why this is and specifically how it affects the right to privacy? Yeah, so um here in the US, we are just reeling um after the publication of two studies that looked at how facial recognition technologies actually recognize faces. And one of the key findings to come out of that it was published by jo Joy Bulawami and Tim Nagamura over at MIT was in the training sets for the data, they were using white men as the primary training data. What that meant was when facial recognition um, systems were built here, they had a 90% recognition rate if you were a white man, but if you had darker skin, if you were black, then it, then it rose to 40% um, 40 inaccuracy. And these were systems that were developed by Microsoft, IBM, um, and Amazon, which have huge market penetration here. But the reason that that was really worrying to me is we use them in our security systems. So we're using them in policing, the FBI are using them, immigration is using them. And if they're misrecognizing uh, black people 40% of the time, we already have cases here in the US where people have been arrested, mi misidentified and arrested. So, so that was really my concern. Okay. Um, now, focusing specifically on facial recognition, do you think a total ban on facial recognition is the only option that we have right now? I think it is. I think in terms of privacy, we have constitutional protections in the US that say that we have the right to privacy. And if the constitution is the document by which we base all our laws and we are a, uh, we are a society of laws, we, we believe in rule of law, the only way to really negotiate that in a system that is completely reliant on taking your pictures without your permission and then cross-referencing them in ways that have you know, criminalization, for example, the bill I wrote was lack of housing to act, lack of access to housing, lack of access to benefits, food. These are basic needs that human beings need, that, that human beings are entitled to in our society. And if they're unconstitutional, they're not legal. And if they're not legal, then they should be banned. Exactly. I agree with you 100%. Uh, my final question to you is, do you think your work in the United States of America can be translated to what is happening in India and what we are seeing in India right now? Yes. Yeah, so I think it really does go back to the research. Um, one paper I referenced looked at black people, but there was a follow up paper in 2019 where they were looking at gen where they were looking at shades of skin. So if you um, in Indian society, because it does uh, go along caste systems and you have um, some caste, you have like the Dalit, my, I always say my Dalit brothers and sisters, um, because I feel that we're treated the same way by our societies who are typically working outside and who are typically doing 
uh, doing jobs that keep them in the sun, then their shade, the shade of their skin is going to be darker than somebody from a higher caste who's potentially doing work inside and being shade, uh, uh, and then not having that access to the sun, right? So um, you then have a technology that criminalizes people with darker skin, and that criminalization of people with darker skin is going to fall upon lower caste people, which then becomes a human rights abuse. So I would say that the work that Black people are doing um, in the US on biometrics and trying to get plans is in conversation with the work that is being done um, in India and should cross lines and we should be sharing research tactics and of course resources. It takes money to do this. So we need to be thinking of ways to make sure that this type of work is funded. Yes. I agree with you. Thank you so much for agreeing to be a part of Privacy Supreme. It was wonderful having you. Uh, are there any you know, parting words that you would want to say to uh, your friends in India? Yes, that you do have a friend. You have a friend in New York City uh, that we are, uh, I know AI for the People are excited and let's keep talking, let's keep collaborating and let's keep protecting not just our privacy because we are privileged, we're here, but the but the privacy of the people who are most marginalized and empowering them to put their put, you know to put their needs forward so thank you for having me thank you Natalia, for being here